Welcome to Intermediate Macro at Tennessee Tech University. Uh, my name is Jeremy Chiquette, and I will be your instructor for the semester. Um, so I really want to just go over a little bit of the course in this lecture, kind of like, you know, like that first day, like when you go to in-person classes, uh, which I really miss teaching, um, and the teacher gives you the syllabus and says, here's all the course policies and the rules and things you can do and things you can't do and all that stuff. That's really all this is going to be. It's just because we're not in person, I have to do it on a video that's posted to YouTube. So whatever, let's get started. About me. I have a PhD in economics and I got it from Clemson University. Uh, I am by all intents and purposes, purely a macroeconomist. Uh, my fields of specialization were in monetary economics, growth and development, and international finance. So pretty much all of the major uh, areas of economics or macroeconomics these days uh, was what I focused in. Uh, my dissertation research looked at unconventional monetary policy and how it affected the real economy. Um, if you're wondering what that is, we'll learn a little bit more about it like towards the end of the course. Um, but as a, a short little discussion on it, I guess, um, in 2007, 2000, well, really 2008, at the height of the financial crisis, um, interest rates were constrained at zero. It's what's known as a zero lower bound for nominal interest rates. And the Federal Reserve had to think outside the box if they wanted to use monetary policy to still have it try to influence real economic variables, things like output or unemployment. Um, so I looked at how that affected the U.S. economy. There's another chapter that looks at how it affected the global economy. And then um, as a completely different topic, uh, my third chapter was on the effects of Jim Crow laws on educational outcomes for African Americans. Um, that was a pretty cool model, actually. I really enjoyed working on that. And uh, one of these days it will be published somewhere in a hopefully good journal, which would be great. Um, so we're going to be learning about both growth and business cycle models in this course. And because I have fields of specialization in both growth and business cycle models, um, I'd like to think of myself as fairly well suited to be your teacher. We'll see about that, though. Um, I've been teaching at Tennessee Tech for more than three years. They haven't gotten pissed off and fired me yet, which is great for me. Um, this isn't my primary job. Uh, so I'm not always going to be able to answer emails during the day. I try to be able to answer them through the day. Sometimes I get lucky and I can. Other times um, I can't. Now, when I am working my other job, uh, there will be a couple of weeks this semester that I may or may not be able to get back to you within even a day or two. Um, it's just it's going to be a really busy cycle doing like forecast stuff. Uh, but I think that's only going to be once during this semester. But in general, if I take more than two days to get back to you, send me another email. And during that like week or so that things are going to be really busy, I will have prepared all the lectures in advance. I will have posted everything in advance for you. I will also be telling you in advance when that week is. So um, don't worry. Uh, don't freak out or anything like that if I don't get back to you then. It's just kind of the way the world works. So this is intermediate macroeconomics, which means we're going to be building on a lot of what you learn in principles of macroeconomics. The lectures, um, I'll be recording them. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless me. Um, I'll be recording the lectures, posting them on YouTube, and then I'll post the link on iLearn and inform you via email. I try to post them every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, sometimes I deviate from that a little bit. Sometimes it comes out like Monday. Sometimes I'll post it Friday or not Friday, Wednesday, uh, and then like maybe also Friday. Um, but generally speaking, Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and if I do deviate from that where it's like, you know, going to be like Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday night and you still haven't seen a video and I you know don't think I can post it yet or whatever, I'll let you know. So... Um, don't, don't worry too much about that, and I also try to get some of these videos recorded well in advance, so that way if I do fall behind, then, you know, I can just post a new video, and it's a lot easier than trying to, like, you know, rush and catch up. Um, the video lectures are going to cover just one topic at a time, and they're generally going to be somewhere between 20 to 45 minutes in length. Um, in case you're wondering, like, you know, why the lectures aren't 75 minutes like they are in in-person classes... That's because I'm not going to be doing any pausing for questions in my lectures. Normally, you know, like when you're teaching, um, you know, I kind of, I'll, I'll 
talk for a couple of minutes and somebody will, you know, ask me a question. I'll spend some time answering that and I'll kind of survey the room, whatever. You know, I can't really do that online because, well, there's no instantaneous feedback. Lectures are asynchronous. These are to be watched on your own. So I try to just condense the amount of actual speaking I would be doing in that 75 minute lecture down to, you know, just the 20, 45 minutes it would be. Sometimes you'll get two videos assigned for one day. Other times it'll just be one video. Um, rarely do I think it'll be more than two videos for one day. Um, the text. What is the text? Well, the textbook is Intermediate Macroeconomics on NyQuil When the Talking Pink Elephants Start Making Sense. And it was written by me. It's really just a compilation of notes that I made while I was teaching this class in previous years at Clemson University. Um, I've never taught this class at Tennessee Tech. I've only taught it at Clemson when I was a graduate school there. Um, and it's stuff that I compiled while I was preparing to teach intermediate macro the first, what, two times, I guess I taught, I think I've taught it like three or four times total. Um, and then also it's got stuff that I learned in graduate school. Like, so the growth and development stuff as we kind of move further on in that section, um, there's a little bit more like PhD level stuff in there. Um, of course I'll, I'll have it all watered down. So it's, you know, you're not like solving out PhD level models or anything like that. Um, so don't worry. This is, I, the, the material is advanced, but I do not make this course hard. If that makes any sense for you guys, hopefully it does. Um, and by doing this, well, one, you get to save like $200. So I'm sure that's hopefully going to make you guys really happy. Uh, and two, I get to teach you exactly what I think is necessary. So there's no extra crap for us to have to sift through. There's nothing like me going, well, I want you to read chapter five, section one A, but skip one B and one C. And then you need to read like section two B. Like, I don't want to go through any of that crap. I really just want to be like, hey, look, here's the material. Read it start to finish. Boom. There we go. Um, now, this book is a work in progress, so I will be making edits throughout the semester. If I make any significant edits, I'll be informing you of any changes that I've made. If it's like a minor grammar thing, I probably won't tell you, but if it's something that would really affect your learning outcomes, um, then, well, yeah, clearly you need to know and you will be made aware. Uh, the book's posted on iLearn, um, so when you just go there, I think it's like book or something like that, that section, uh, you can just go there, click it, read the book, there you go. Grading. Let's talk about how this course is going to be graded. So you're going to have problem sets, exams, and a final. Uh, the problem sets are 30%. There's three exams at 45%, so each one's 15% of your grade. And the final exam is 25% of your grade. Um, before each exam, you're going to have at least two or three problem sets. Um, and the problem sets are going to be pretty close to the exam. So if you can do well in the problem sets, you'll theoretically do very well on the exams. Um, I will be grading the problem sets in this class for accuracy, so that way I make sure that you're really getting the practice you need on how to do some of these problems. Um, each exam is going to be worth 15% of your grade, um, and it will be posted on iLearn. Uh, you'll have a couple of days to work on it on your own, and then you'll submit it. Um, if you have an A after the third exam, you don't have to take the final. You're exempt. Hooray. Congratulations. Have a great summer. Uh, have a great life. Hope everything goes well for you. Um, if you don't have an A, you are required to take the exam. Um, if it's anything 89.5 or higher, you have an A in my class, uh, unless specified otherwise. Uh, I generally don't do curves in the class, although if the class average is below an 85 for an exam, then I will curve up to an 85. The way I see it is if the class average isn't an 85, that's my fault. That's not your fault and I shouldn't make you guys pay for it. So I will curve everything up such that the average is at least an 85. Um, so when you get a problem set or an exam, I've got some pretty strict submission rules. Uh, here's what you need to do. First, you got to print it out. So anytime, anytime I post it, you got to you know go to the library, or whatever, print it out. It's usually just a couple pages. Write your answers on that problem set. And then you need to scan the document with the answers that you've had written on it and submit that scan document only as one file. Don't submit multiple image files. Um, so when you're posting this, if you see multiple image files, it means you screwed up, you need to fix it. I only want one file. The reason I want one file is because I use like a little pad thing to handwrite comments on the homework submissions. 
if there are multiple files or the submission is incorrect, it makes it a lot harder for me to grade your work. And because it makes it harder for me to grade your work, I just won't be accepting it. Uh, if you submit something incorrectly, I will make you resubmit it before I will actually grade it. And it does come at a penalty of at least 20 points, possibly more depending on how long it takes for you to be able to resubmit it. And of course, how egregious the infraction is in the first place. Um, generally speaking, it shouldn't be an issue. If you do have problems, of course, please reach out to me and let me know. Um, I'm not totally unwilling to make exceptions, but they, they need to be good, like good reasons. It can't just be like, oh, well, you know, uh, um, my car didn't start today and, you know, I was five minutes late to class, so I couldn't do, no, no, don't, don't give me any of that crap. Uh, you know, if, if your grandmother died for the ninth time this semester, anything like that, um, tell me, email me, give me a decent reason and I'm willing to work with you. But, um, the way that the problem sets are designed, the first page has like a little box for like, you know, all the, the total points for each individual question. Um, I need to be able to see that and I need all of it to be in just one file so I can just scroll through everything and, you know, grade it out accordingly. Um, if it doesn't look exactly the same printed out as it did in the PDF that you downloaded, well, that means... You screwed up somehow. Some I, I think like if you try to print it from your phone, it ends up looking weird or something like that. Um, don't don't do that. Print it in such a way that it looks exactly like um, the PDF that was submitted or that was posted on iLearn for you guys to use. Now, a lot of you will want to like you know maybe type out your answers or something like that on the document. Um, I am okay with that. Only if you use LaTeX. Uh, so I use LaTeX to prepare all these documents. Uh, it's a free open source software. It's absolutely freaking fantastic. It's way better than Microsoft Word. It's way prettier. All the slideshows that I use are done using LaTeX. Um, the book was written up in LaTeX. All the exams are in LaTeX. It's so much nicer. Um, if you know how to use LaTeX or you would like to learn how to use LaTeX, what I'll be doing is I'll be posting the tech file along with the problem sets and the exams. So you can always download the tech file, enter your answers on the tech file, you know, just type everything out, submit that and the PDF with your answers on it. And if you do that, I'll give you an extra 10 points every time. Um, LaTeX is an incredibly useful tool, especially if you have any designs on going to graduate school, you will definitely want to know how to use LaTeX because a lot of your graduate research uh, will be required to be done up in LaTeX. So, you know, is what it is, I guess. Um, totally up to you, but don't use like Microsoft Word to type your answers on it or anything like that. I will know, I will be able to tell, and then I your grade will suffer as um, a result. So, mean stuff out of the way. Believe it or not, I'm really not that mean of a guy. Um, but I am very strict on the homework submissions because, well, if it's not submitted right, then I, I can't do my job the right way and everything gets jammed up. So I might as well just be strict at the beginning with that. What are we going to be learning about? What are we going to be covering? Well, this is dynamic macro. So really, you're either going to get tour of a graveyard or nursery in a macro course. This is designed to be a nursery. So there's going to be a little bit of math because, you know, the, the new cutting edge macroeconomic research, it's a lot of math. You will need some calculus to be able to complete the course successfully. Really just a couple derivatives here and there. You won't have to take very many and all the ones that you will have to take on an exam, you will have already gotten practice doing on a problem set and you will have seen that from a lecture that I've given already. So there shouldn't be anything that you, you just absolutely can't do. Now, the good thing about doing it this way, you're going to see macro in its current form. You're going to see the relevant research. You're going to see all of the like up-to-date stuff in macroeconomics, and you're really going to see the discipline the way current researchers see it. So you're going to be learning a lot of the modern solutions to existing questions in the field, and you're going to learn how to analyze the macroeconomy using these tools. Like I said, it might get a little tough here and there, but it's definitely going to be rewarding to learn it this way. And 
nice little thing is if any of you really like this and decide to go to graduate school, uh, you're going to do really well in the macro classes. Um, so what's the outline of the course going to be like? Well, we start with growth and development. So we learn about the evolution of growth and development models. We learn like the simple models, and then we kind of go through some of the more advanced stuff, and we go through a couple of applications here and there. Uh, now, the growth models themselves, they look at long-run dynamics. So it's like, you know, how things like technology, ideas, different forms of capital investment can drive how the economy grows over time. So it's not like, you know, how did the economy go from 2022 to 2023? It's like... How did the economy grow from 1900 to 1950 or something like that? How did it grow every 10 years? We're not really concerned about things like recessions in growth and development. We're more concerned about things that drive like long-run growth and prosperity, more like looking at um, like you know, how generations are affected rather than how you know, you're affected between this year and, well, I don't know, next quarter or something like that. Then we move on to business cycle models. That's where we're concerned with things like recessions. It's more short to medium run stuff. Uh, we look at really here more how governments and central banks can impact the business cycle. Now, we still have things in the models like ideas and technology. They still matter, but it's really more just to control for that kind of variation so we can see how policy interventions impact things like recessions. So, you know, the, the core of it is like, does the government need to stay in or stay out of the economy? And, um, well, in the interest of being fair, the answer is kind of yes and kind of no. Uh, there are times where they need to stay out. There's times where their intervention is definitely, um, well, welfare enhancing, we'll say. Uh, generally, the monetary policy tends to be a little bit more impactful than fiscal policy, but um, that's, that's a different talk for a different time. Um, and finally... We're going to be learning about the impacts of monetary and fiscal policy across two major episodes in U.S. history. The first is the financial crisis of 07 and 08, and then the second is the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and maybe, if time's permitting, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll learn about the bank run that happened in 2023. Um, but that was really just more of a scare than anything else, um, except, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, but screw them. So uh, with all of that said, um, thank you for watching this video. There's going to be more along the way. Um, enjoy the course. I'm looking forward to teaching you guys, and um, have a great semester. Thanks for watching. Bye.